Back in the day, everyone used to just just come to your house and tell you send a message to your city and say, We come, this is what we want. You don't you don't meet our demands, we'll burn the town down. Put my car up, put put the handbrake up, the window's already down. I looked up, as soon as I looked up, he just sliced my throat. First thing, and he just started going for my chest. So I remember this girl, yeah, she just cradled in his head and she's crying, yeah. And I just said sorry to him. And I walked off of that. That's what I did. My mom's called me up. You know, did you know what happened in Woolwich? Those fucking scumbags. Where, where are you? I'm like, mom. But Army has its own challenges, like the murder of Lee Rigby. I don't know why. Because when you fail, Army is brutal. They just got back from Hanslow. That, that fully operation tour. The, the unit had suffered casualties, yeah? And then when they got back, Southeast Asians in Hanslow spat at them. I see heads being cut off and babies bitten in by dogs. So, the, the, I don't know if people don't remember that, but from my end of the world, they will provide graphical images of war to say people, this is war. This is what it's like. My existence, it's in my blood. I can't, I can't ignore my, the greatness I come from. To me, it's great. I'm amazing. So today we've got Aiden on the podcast. I've watched the other stuff he's done. He's a very powerful, emotional speaker. His nickname was Mad Dog when he was in the British Infantry. He's an Azeri. He's from Azerbaijan, as the Westerners say, Azerbaijani. <laughs> but he's got crazy stories, including there was an attempt to kill him and his throat ended up getting slashed, but we're going to get to that. So, huge thank you for coming on, Aidan. Thank you, likewise. I appreciate your host hospitality. <laughs> yeah. Right. And we watched, you know, the other stuff you did, but we'd like to get into much more detail about what it was like for you growing up first. Yeah, that you want me to go to the very beginning? Yes, please. So, I was born in 86 in, uh, in Baku. It's the capital of Azerbaijan. Um, and my, 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 my childhood was fine. I didn't, when I look back, I had no, I, I didn't know no better, and my mum and dad always provided. So whatever they provided to me, I feel that was the the means and that, that was the necessities and that was the norm, right? Looking back now, we had more than other people and other children in the society, and other children had more than us. So for example, like things like caviar, it's not it's not it's not luxury where I come from. It's everyday commodity for society. It's, it's it's not expensive either, and sometimes I have that for breakfast, <laughs> with that no cereal. So that that was the norm, you know, in 1980s and before the Soviet Union broke up. But in general, so uh, my dad is a geologist. My he was born in the village. My mom was born in the city. So um, my dad was born in '53. My mom was born in '61, and then they were raised by people that survived World War Two, and but my dad actually was raised by a man that survived World War One too, because my grandfather was born in 1910. We're going back to the Ottoman Empire because we were talking weren't we, about yeah. Mehmet the Second versus Count Dracula the Impaler. Oh Impala. God, that, it, it was even worse than that. Because it, if, if people don't understand that, back in the day, everyone used to just just come to your house and tell you send a message to your city and say, "We come. This is what we want. You don't you don't meet our demands. We'll burn the town down." And that was p generic across the board in the human civilizations. Anyone that wanted any power or, or, or land, the pragmatic means of doing things didn't really exist. They were all about violence, all about invading and threatening people and meeting people's demands. And if you don't meet them, they just burn down the village and kill everyone. So tell us about your grandfather then. So my grandfather was born in 1910 and he was, um, he was the last child of 13 children. So I'm the last child and my dad is the last child. Hence why the massive gap in age but i'm very blessed for that because uh it just i just know so much because i every time you talk about things right I, my my granddad was um 29 years old when nazis invaded europe 
All right, so like that is younger than what I am now. That's nearly like nine years younger, like eight years younger. So it's it's a significant impact on me in general because obviously I wasn't being told this stuff. My mum and dad would not explain this. Stuff. They would never teach me any hate or any evil. They never expose me to all the evil unless I see uh, Rwanda war on the telly and it was graphical. The Bosnian war, the Chechen war. Like the TV in my day was graphical. I see heads being cut off and babies bitten in by dogs. So the, the, I don't know if people don't remember that, but from my end of the world, they will provide graphical images of war to say people, this is war. This is what it's like. So um, they didn't really have any political correctness or concern about children because socially your children should be in bed while they do at 10 o'clock at night watching TLE. Anyway. Cut the long story short. Uh, no, long story <laughs> long. Like, long story long. Long story long. So my grandfather was born in this little city called town called, village called Shusha. So he was the son of Islamic scholar who, who literally got executed in World War One. So I don't have exact evidence behind the death of my great grandparents. They died in World War One, and I know he was an Islamic scholar. That's the only evidence I have right now, and I can't find any more. But the reason I have to assume that he was executed, it be for two reasons. Whether he was the person that could caliphate on the world and when with the centralized powers to invade Europe, or he was against that and he got killed by the locals or whatever it may be. It, it, this, or he might be killed by the Russians because it was pro-Germany, or maybe got killed by the Germans because it was pro-Russians. I don't know, or pro the Turks. So whatever it may be, it was, um, it was a very significant moment in like in the history of my bloodline and the history of the world and my region anyway. So um, the World War I ended, my grandfather was seven years old. He was raised by his siblings because he got lucky because, you know, 13, 12 siblings. They just raised him. He became a doctor. So I don't know if people want to understand that. Like in Islamic world, we are not classless society. Whoever tells you that there is no class base, they're, they're lying to you, okay? We are very, we have a significant classes, we have a class structure, we have the people in highest powers, we have people at the bottom of economic ladder, and so on. Islam is, does not see people equally across the board. It's just not something that is dictated to people. And especially when it goes to, to scholars and people of significant uh, standing in society and so on, you know, if you have a book and you, you already deemed that educator and so on, it's just pretty primitive existence and primitive viewpoint of, of mankind in general. But it existed, it still exists now in certain parts of the world. Anyway, so I got lucky that he come from a significant family and then he survived World War One. He survived World War Two, and then my parents got conceived, conceived from two different branches of the world. But um, my grandfather actually met my nan during the war. Like my nan is Ukrainian, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was born in this li little village in Ukraine, right, just outside Kiev, about 150 miles away. And so she was born in 1923. So she was awake and fully alive for that whole entire evilness that Stalin implemented on its own people, not to mention what he starved about 40 million Ukrainians just through his collectivation legislation and economic legislation, agricultural leg legislations that he was implementing and they were not feasible. And there were, there were there were times in Ukraine, right, there were more bodies on the streets in these villages than there were people to collect those bodies. They used to put them in mass graves, like the, the no crop, just put them in mass graves. So my grandma would survive that. Then 16 years of age, Nazis invade Europe and so on. And my grandfather was a medical officer in the Soviet army on the Azeri branch, okay, Azerbaijani branch. So he met my nan that he, this is the story my dad tells me. So my dad told me that nan was <laughs> getting on the train that was heading toward the Eastern Front. <laughs> Granddad took her passport, said, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. You're staying right here. The, the train got ambushed and then people died on that train and then he, she stayed with him in this little village. He built his house for her. He got, he, he got this, the garden, you know, used to just walk up to or get a lift to, to the local bazaar to get some meat for the kids and that. And they just lived off the land for 60 years and they raised four children who went to the main city, the Baku, to go uh, highest level of education they could acquire. Like my... Uh, <clears throat> My uncle, my granddad's 
older son, this is my dad's side of the family, he got like MBE, CBE, OBE from the Soviet Azeri time for contributing to agriculture of the society. And, 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 and so he raised pretty successful people according to the times of our times, okay, of day times, not my times, it's just day times. Considering that they just survived World, World War Two, and there's too much for me to describe about the significant impact that war, war had on people in general in that region of the world. But for example, we pro pro provided 50% of the world oil towards effort of the war. You know, and we consider a, a, a population of 3 million people, 250,000 have died. That's a significant number of men and people of capable status or even women too, you know, because women just, just go. Okay, so... I didn't die, I'm alive because my grandparents did something that I don't have to do. So I don't feel the pain of my ancestors. I'm not a primitive tribe member like that. Like whatever they did, cheers granddad, thank you very much. I don't want to do that. Like I don't even feel the pain. Like I, I will never do that. I feel, I, I know what happened. Yeah, I just don't know how visible it was for them. Do you know, I don't know if they see babies being tortured and that, I don't know what they see, but I know significance of Stalin and Soviet influence, the Nazis invading Germany, uh, Nazis invading Russia, and then, like, it's just a lot of going on there, right, you know, and not to me, <laughs> it's very important to understand that I got lucky with my granddad, because he was born in 1910, he prayed five times a day, he gave me a lot of fundamental education, and, and all those elements, my, my dad's, uh, my mum's dad, that's a different story, because he grew up in an orphanage in 1939, yeah, so, and I don't know if anyone knows this, or anyone even understands the concept of being an orphanage, right, no matter who you are, where you're from, or what part of the world you're from, what, what, I don't give a fuck who you are, yeah, your life is insignificant, worthless, and it's, You've been treated like it. You you get abused sexually, violently, whatever it may be. Every orphanage on the planet, fucking earth. This is no exceptions. Unwanted children were never wanted by anyone back in the day. So back in the day, unwanted children in England, say 17th, 16th century. What were you doing? You thieving? You you cutting someone else's wallet? And then you you oi thief, stop! The crowd will descend upon you and they kill the child. People used to do that in England. They would hang so, them. You know, and then, and it's just, it's, it's, it's existence of humanity, okay? So my grandfather, who grew up in an orphanage, got released from orphanage, obviously. I don't know if he had any education. I don't know. So it sounds like your grandparents had a rough time. How did they you had a rough time, but I don't know how rough that was because I wasn't there. So I don't feel the pain of it. I just know the story because it's, my existence, it's in my blood. I can't, I can't ignore my, the greatness I come from. To me, it's great. I'm amazing. Like, you have no idea how uh, um, economically prosperous I am now or what I actually have. But I'm not really going to dictate to the world that, look at me, I've got so much money. It's not about that. I'm wealthy due to foundation that's been laid for me by the people before me. We're going to get to that. You know? So what? you had a lot of siblings? I've only got one sister. Oh, one sister. She's just older than me. She's much more successful. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask is, how your parents met. My my parents. So my dad just went to the city and there's a village boy. Met a city girl and fell in love with her. Love at first sight. And time. they've been, I don't know. I've never really, well, we, we don't have these conversations. But, you know, um, they've been together ever since. They've been together ever since. And it's just, it's just funny though, how uh, my grandfather grew up in orphanage. He's never gave any hate to his daughters and somehow he was able to marry a woman who was a daughter of a state police officer yeah so somehow my great grandfather my nan's my mum's mother's um father allowed some orphan yeah some random orphan of no social class marry his daughter so what brought about the move out of the country? Just migration, just an economic m migration. So obviously I was alive during the Soviet Union collapse and then we migrated like eight, nine years later that into, into to England. Just to, just for my, uh, and it's, 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 it's really sad though, because um, I had it good to some extent. I just didn't know better. 
And then coming to England, and I just, I had to learn everything from an elementary perspective. And the language barrier was the biggest element. And, ge and then kids are just fucking mean in general. So not having language barriers, I know it, do you know what? It pisses me off sometimes, yeah? That how smart I actually was standing next to them, but I couldn't tell them, you know? It broke my shit. Couldn't express yourself properly. That must have been frustrating. So, um... My schooling in this country was pretty insignificant and it was just horrible and I didn't like it. And I, I, I used to just get buses to um, <laughs> Natural History Museum during school days and just be on my own. Because you endured a, an array of racist abuse, didn't you? I don't know why they... Because I, I went to school in Quebec school and that, I, it, the weird thing about me is just like... I've cl quickly realized that my mum my and dad were not the point of help to help me to navigate through this society. I knew that subconsciously and consciously. They couldn't give me much wisdom how to do things. I needed to learn the language and I needed to learn everything. So, and they didn't really bring their child into this country to face any challenges that he faced because they didn't know that these challenges might, might exist. Maybe, I don't think they did. You know, it wasn't on purpose done. So, you know, I went to school. I went to school myself. I literally went to Kibble School front gate, walked into the reception area, said, I want to come to school in my broken English, right? And then a couple of weeks later that I had this, just people just were fucking abusive. And I, 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 I needed to make friends, right? I had no fucking friends. I needed fucking friends, you know? I'm a fucking child. There's no, <clears throat> there's nobody fucking around me. I'm a social child, I need to make friends with boys, I need to make friends with girls, I need friends, you know. And they just didn't want to be friends with me, for whatever fucking reason. Uh, whatever it may be, it's fine, whatever. I don't, but when they start racially abusing me and they start fucking hit, hitting me or whatever it may be, ah, uh, mate, there's only so much you can do, because eventually I'm going to snap. And uh, that was obvious. And uh, uh, it, So, I've enrolled myself in school when I started school, but then... It's weird, I must have gone into summer holidays, right? And I remember I was walking down the street and I looked to my right, there was a group of boys standing by this block of flats, smoking weed and stuff like that. Uh, bear in mind, right, I don't know who these people are and I don't know what the fuck is going on. So I just walked up to them and tried to talk to them, okay? So the fucking yeah? It just broke my jaw and they dropped me while some African kid went through my pockets and they robbed me. I said hello to these kids, yeah? And they just fucking did that. Anyway, that's what happened. That's the true, uh, true fucking story. And then... How did, weeks, how, did, how did you regroup from that? Did uh, you have to get a hospital? No, it was just a crack on my jaw. I'm, I'm, a 13, I'm, I'm very small. I was very small. You know, believe me, if, you, if you're 15 years old, you're 100% pretty much taller than me too. You know, and, and, and it's just what I faced, right? It doesn't matter because... Um, I'm in a better place than most of these people will ever be able to be, based just because of how I am. Yeah, and that's not my fault, it is my fault, but it also my genes, my foundation has been laid for me, and I can't ignore the greatness of my history and my people, you know? And I'm a very proud man, so where I come from. Now I can articulate myself in the language, I'm pretty much isolating myself from all these genetic so social disparities that exist. I'm not part of Bain community. I'm a, I'm a diaspora, mate. Listen, uh, listen, jog on. Anyway, cut the lock, um, moving forward, there was this incident where um, I just went to school. I just remember standing in this next to this shed area, smoking with these children, fucking around and whatnot. I remember she just, just start fucking abusing me. I'm like, Oof. and then she start hitting me. Just this random girl. I don't know why I did. I genuinely know because I was never really sexually advanced anyway. I'm very primitive when it comes to my sexuality, especially in school. I wasn't edu I don't No one gave me a fucking education how to put on a fucking condom, bruv. Like, I'm not... This, this shit didn't happen where I come from, right? So, to me, I don't know what was going on there. And then she started fucking slapping me and stuff. And then... And I don't remember that. She just fucking abusing me. And then... I grabbed her arms and then she just went to me, you Albanian immigrant and she spat in my face. I just knocked her out, right? I remember that. I knocked her out. 
right? Everyone just got shocked a bit. And then people started abusing me again. I got rushed in school during lunch break or whatnot. Nothing significant. Nothing that hurt my pride or gave me detrimental uh, physical injuries or anything like that. Now, probably, they're trying to fucking stab me. Right, right now, there are, there are children in this country right now that are being abused but other children, because they cannot speak English. And these children come from all backgrounds. This is not a single element. Believe it or not, it cannot be contributed to a single skin color. It's bullshit. Yeah, there are, there are people from Caribbean background who've got a thick Caribbean accents right now in school just being laughed at because they say something in English that isn't British or London dialect yeah and same with africans same with everybody else it exists it's not it, it it is what exists in schools in england unfortunately okay so the school was terrible for me i didn't really do well and i got sent to some referral unit and i felt that was really unjust because like it just denied me my um the education that i, I enjoyed like i liked school but not in england and then, um, then I moved from Kidbrook area, Charlton area, to Abbey Wood. And so the, the boy that knew, saw, knew me from school, the boy that saw me when my jaw was broken, with, it was with them and all stuff like that, uh, he moved to Abbey Wood too, but he wasn't the, the threat. He wasn't the individual that was involved in any physical or violent actions against me. So I kind of start, start uh, he kind of introduced me to these boys in Abbey Wood. And, um, and they like me. They're just fucking just some bro. <laughs> There's just some people, just some kids from England. 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 22 year olds. All the 20, 22 plus year olds, they were the ones that had the monopoly in the, on the estate, puff, sniff, brown, white. Green. Everything. <laughs> Everything, whatever, whatever, whatever it may be, but it was just safe. Like I felt safe, random. No one would come around and rob us. I actually had one of the advantages. I don't know why they felt they could confine in me, but I knew everyone's stash houses like simultaneously, and I wasn't. I'm not. I'm not inclined that way. I'm not inclined to trip people up or or, or be malevolent or evil towards people. Just my natural nature. But I just knew stuff that felt comfortable and I went to their mum's houses. The mum would give me a bacon sandwich or, well, not bacon to me, but they'll give him a bacon sandwich. I said, I want an egg. And I said, can you not fry in the same frying pan? And she didn't know what that means, but I had to explain to old Julie, but it's okay. I got, I got the grip of it. They got the grip of it. And it was just fine. I got grew up with them and I had some minor convictions. There were minor little violent incidents where I wasn't a perpetrator of that incident. Like, for example, I um I think I have no idea how old I am at that moment in time, but I am standing across the road from a pub outside the cab office, and I'm smoking the fag. So I look to my left, I see a boy and a girl walking towards me. I didn't pay attention to them in any significant level, and um there were two guys in the in the cab office who were with me. I, I was with them. Okay. And then this boy tried to get into the cab office, like just trying to walk into the cab office to put all the cab. And those two guys that I was with, right, didn't let him. Cut, and it all broke out into the scarf. I, I'm, I'm standing outside, smoking the joint, looked in, and within like 30 seconds, they glassed him, they bottled him, they smashed the fucking living data out of him, right? Still to this day, yeah, mate, that kid got beaten up for no reason. And I still don't know why they did that to him. And I stood and watched it all. And I feel like a fucking scumbag. But I was still vulnerable in my head. So I remember this girl, yeah. She just cradled in his head. And she's crying, yeah. And I just said sorry to him. And I walked off of that. That's what I did. I just knew, I, I, I'm not into that. Like, I'm not, this is not me. I'll smash the fuck out of you if circumstances dictate. But I just don't see... I, I'm not with friends like that. I'm not with people like that. This is not my people. This is not my friends. I'm not inclined that way. So, hey, hey then uh, if... You know, you wasn't in the mix of those people. Why did you feel responsible or feel a scum, like a scumbag? No, I just felt responsible that I didn't intervene. The 
kid got beat off for no reason. Really badly, you know. But could there have been a reason? Could there have been a reason you didn't know about? Him. Yeah. No, man, this just a random child. Just random kid. Like, he came back in the pub the next day with a strap, yeah? And everyone's calling us up and saying, he's in here with a gun looking for you lot. I'm like, is he looking for me though? Like, I want to know that. I'm not in the pub, but I'm thinking to myself, do you remember me touching you? Because I didn't, right? I did not do shit to you. I didn't even insult you, you know, so. And you got in trouble for that because you were in the I didn't the get scene. into trouble for that. Okay. I'm just saying uh, like I was in the in the, in the, in the presence of this fucking scummy move, right? Yeah, and I didn't interfere because I felt weak and vulnerable, and I I, I just didn't. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. that's it. So I believe that um, I like to do the right things. I love my fucking high horse of morality and ethics. I fucking love it. Being in the army too, my I will get on my fucking horse and I will look down at you and I will get my Ottoman sword out. And I will chop your head off. I'm sorry. I, I'm programmed differently. And this is the fact. I just love it. Because it's hard to do the right thing when it's hard to do the right thing. It's for everyone. Would you say violence on the streets is probably more brutal than what you've seen in the army? Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. I've experienced seeing more violence on the streets than... I've witnessed in the army. There was no violence towards me in the army. Uh, the army is not a violent environment. What was the worst thing you saw back then on the streets? Um, that. That was the worst thing I've experienced. Like I, I, we, I, we, 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 we did, we, there was an incident where we beat someone up, but it was some fucking crackhead who literally would not get here, fuck off and leave us alone. Right? And like literally, we was there for about 10 minutes and it was like, he was a fragile looking individual on brown and white. There was no significant threat from you, right? And you're just, it just won't get it. So that was the, but it wasn't even that bad because I think he deserved it because he really asked for it and it would just leave us alone. But in general, that was the worst thing that I've really experienced in from the, my own perspective and watching just like, there was no need for it because there was other incidents where like randomly on the streets in England, a boy and a girl walking down the street and the four men just beat him to death. Like, why? You know, what the fuck is that about? Were they robbing him? No, man. This was already in newspapers where he looked like Ant Deck, one of them, where he was Ant Deck. Four blokes across, all right, mate, you look like Ant or the Deck one. And it's like, cheese, mate. And they're like, what did you say? And they beat him to death. Some, some of them were soldiers. He said it right there, recruits or whatever. You know, I mean, like, what the fuck? This is disgusting. I don't know how that's okay to do it. And I don't know how it's okay even to normalize that. Like, it's not okay. But um, in general terms, the people I hang around with, they're not inclined towards unnecessary violence. You know, I got lucky like that, right? So the boys that liked me, right? They weren't violent. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't degenerates, you know? We sold drugs. Yes, we sold drugs. We sat in the park all summer and have everyone coming to us. And even the ice cream man will come around. We'll, we'll go to get some ice cream, go back to the park. No one would rob us. No one would hassle us. No one would rob me as an individual when I used to do the white and brown phone. So it was, a fu it was fine like that. Like I felt comfortable in that community and I was part of that economic ladder and I was navigating through that economic society and that society in general. And everybody knows me on the manor. Like, everybody, right now, I've met someone yesterday who literally said to me, what are you doing? Get on the podcast, say no names. <laughs> <laughs> he was very concerned about that. <laughs> but he said, shut up that, shut up. But anyway, he, he said, everyone on the manor is watching it. Like, everyone on the manor is watching it. Right, and that's just people from that estate. Because if I was a scumbag, right, people would have made that clear. And like, I, I, like I've read some comments where people genuinely believe I'm chatting shit about my story. I'm like, yeah, I'm a very clever individual that's gonna get on the internet and say a story and no one's gonna find out. <laughs> of course. So what <sighs> level were you selling drugs on the streets? Uh, not, not, um, not to say that I wasn't going to, um, in too much details, but I'd say that I was doing county lines before 
the society we knew what county lines were. We'd go to Tombridge Wells and all the people that would come to Voking, we would go all the way in Kent as far as we go. And because we knew where the areas are, where the where the demand was. Remember that, right? Let's see. Don't hate the drug dealers. We need to help people get off the drugs. They that demand for the drugs. Remember that, right? Yeah, I will always sell drugs and there's 10 million people in this society right now want something from me that I could make millions from. Damn right I will. In the capitalist society, that is the mindset. Yeah, the mindset to make as much money as you can from as many people as you can, as quickly as you can. But you got arrested. Yeah, I got arrested when I was 15, so I got lucky with that because it was a juvenile conviction. How'd they catch you? I just stand in the park talking to a girl, mate, and an undercover police officer next to me and just said, Can I have some drugs? No, no, he just stopped me for a search, but he was undercover. But he knew that I was standing there and uh, I had some shots in my pocket. I was more concerned about talking to the girl than paying attention to someone walking to me straight up, <laughs> straight up. And she knew that. Yeah, and that they knew that, everyone knew that. And I told everyone, it's fine, I don't care. It's, it's a juvenile conviction, it's not my record. I have no criminal record anyway. So I got lucky that. At 18, I got arrested for a street robbery once again. Some random man got attacked in a block of flats. By the way, but the same individual, but the same individual who beat that boy up outside that cab office. So, so I didn't got nicked for that one. And, and and but I got nicked for the one that I wasn't even there. So this individual from Iraq, he just got attacked and robbed by a group of youths in the block of flats. A couple of months later, he's uh, noticed us all around the shops or something, calls the police, 17 of them had turned up. And I was working the phone, the white and brown phone at that time. And you can see in the video, they're showing the footage in the video of us being approached by a police while we're walking towards them but they're coming around the corner and then in a split second you can see me throw about 800 pound worth of work in the bush to my left i was just standing there next to the bush. i was walking it just you could just see it. and i went to my friend that was a code e that we got nicked with i was like look at that i just threw work there in the in the, in the courthouse and we laughed and then we got told up by the judge because I, I was comfortable that I will not go to prison for this because I did not touch that man. I wasn't even there. Like, I personally had that clean soul. Like, you know, I was not worried about anything. And I didn't even get reminded off for that violent crime. He did. My, it was, so two of us got arrested for the crime. That we, Neither of us was there at the moment anyway. But he had a previous convictions as a juvenile. And some of it is like violence and so on. So they remanded him off for six months. I didn't get remanded because I had no violence or I wasn't a flight risk. So I got blessed for that too. That I need to spend time and remand. And but we got found not guilty in the Crown Court. Like there was clean, not guilty. Nothing. It went anyway. I got found not guilty for that. And then I carried on moving forward. And then I went to college a couple of times, did some courses, met some friends there. Uh and then I met my girlfriend there, who, who I was with me when I got stabbed, like not in the, in the car, but she, I was I wasn't single, so she kind of looked out for me, which is nice for her. Was the stabbing before the throat, or was that the same? Stabbing is the throat. Stabbing is, is one, the throat. Sta okay. Stabbing is the first one. There's only one stabbing that I received. Let's take us through that then. So um, this was a Thursday. I know, I know it was a Thursday. It was end of March, so I was I was in a pub with friends and I was doing a, a packet phone at that time and I really never had any any any, any um, direction in life. I wanted to join the army when I was 16 and I told them before the same group of people, but they all laughed at me and told me I'm going to get killed and blown up and blah, blah, blah. So they put me off it. But um, at that time, I really had no purpose. I, I, I was very depressed in my life. Because I just know that this is more to life than this. I just knew it. Like, this is not the same cycle that I want to be living in. This is not the cycle I want to be with these people. Not because I don't like them. It's because I just know I, I've got more to me. There's more to my game. I just need to find what it is. So it was a Thursday night. And then I'm in the pub with them. I'm like, received the call. I met that guy a couple of times in the past. So it didn't feel unnatural or, or strange. And then... Uh, 
as it's in, I'm, I'm going now, I'm going to go home after this and later on, but whatever. And I drove up to this place and he asked me to meet him around the side in the alleyway. Like, and the, in the past, I met him right outside the house in the daytime. And this is nighttime alleyway. I didn't clock, naive, guard down, not thinking that he's going to rob me because nobody's going to rob me because I'm not a violent person and I haven't really felt any strange people. Like f up until that point, I have never had anyone try to rob me for any drugs whatsoever. Like, I met random men at three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that. Like, no threat whatsoever. So at this time, it's like a 10, 10, 30 at night. So I just turn up to this bit of garages they asked me to do. And as soon as I turn up, so I'm like driving towards it. So I'm driving towards it. So I turned in, I see him, I, I just turn, I turned, pull my car up, put, put the handbrake up. The window's already done. I looked up. As soon as I looked up, he just sliced my throat. First thing, and it just start going for my chest, just start going for my chest, and, and I, like, like I blocked. I remember that so I blocked the first stab, right? And I didn't know what what to do, like, <laughs> randomly, like fuck, like. So well, I was driving a little bit. I, I was driving a little bit forward with my body, so I leaned back. Like it just something my body did for me. My brain dictated to my body. As in dark, like I, I, I've trained, I've, I've, Tony Petit told me how to box. And so I've got head movement and, you know, reactions exist. And so I moved my neck so it didn't penetrate that deep. My carotid artery is right here and the scar's right on the edge of carotid artery. And as you can see, if I, I moved away, so I guess, you know, if you put the blade solid, so you can put the blade like that, yeah, but if you move your hand, but you still slice it, like it doesn't do the yeah. deep penetration. So, that's what happened, all right? Can you see it? Yeah, I can see the scar there. It's thick, quite a thick one, isn't it? Yeah. So that's 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 what happened, right? And he starts stabbing me in my chest and whatever. I grabbed the knife. I start. Oh, it was painful. I'm telling you, right? Yeah, you give him birth. <laughs> I I have to disagree. What happened to me? All right, but anyway, all right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was painful. Taking it painful. It was it was emotionally disturbing. It was just crazy for me, right? I genuinely did not understand what was going on, but my body, my brain was still defending me. So I got lucky. I got lucky that I didn't bleed out. I got lucky that my arteries, like, so I've got a scar on my hand. Can you see this? Right? Yeah. Can you see this? So this is like straight up just scar tissue. Like it was all open here and I could see these bones right here. So it didn't go through the end. It didn't really cut off my farm. It didn't cut off. It just, it was just, damaged right i was just damaged then okay but not detrimentally that it have an impact on my life but it did but nevertheless he he did all that while he was doing that i'm still having the knife and he's telling me stuff about why you're pulling up outside my house uh, by that time i'm just like i don't give a fuck now mate it's too late for telling me anything right if you put a knife to my throat demand the work you would get it you would have got it and uh I don't know what will happen afterwards, right? But it wouldn't have been in my favor. I'm aware of that. So whatever he did, right? It just, it, he did it. He decided that it was necessary. Okay, fine. Whatever. But while he was doing that, I still I, I somehow put the car in reverse. And this is not automatic. It's a gear Clio. You have to press it down and put it to the reverse. That still takes a second. It's still pain. And if you, you know, sometimes when you drive a kind of fucking gearbox, oh. you know, I don't know. I don't know if that happened. I don't remember these things, but I know these are the, these are the obstacles I had in front of me to free myself. You know, yeah, I, my guard was completely down. He had every advantage on me to murder me, right? And he couldn't, and he didn't. And I reversed the car somehow. He's hanging onto the car like it's a fucking Hollywood movie. I don't know why you, <laughs> why are you holding onto the car? If the car's reversed, like why? What, what, what was the purpose of that? I crashed the car. He just walked off, like calmly. Just walked off. Was I, he like, high? I don't know. Probably. I'm assuming, I'm assuming there's something psychologically disturbing about this individual when he felt the need to um just. Just, just cut someone's throat and rob them from my. If I'm gonna rob someone, right? I'm demanding it 
you give me the weapon, uh, the product first, and then I'm cutting you. But I'm not cutting you at the throat because I guess I don't know where the drugs are. What if you plug him in? I don't want to go into your balls to get them. Get them out yourself, mate. With your throat slice, you ain't doing that. So this is what people don't think logically. Like if you're going to do something, you've got to do it properly and you need to evaluate the, your actions and how you're going to do it to eliminate any possibility of failure. You know, it's a basic stuff. So he did all that. He walked off. At that time I got out, I'm just like, I'm in a bad place, right? <laughs> I dropped the drugs down the drain and then I start making noise in the street. <laughs> And this is some random man from top of the block of flats from a distance away just goes, Oi, mate, I've called an ambulance. I'm like, he must have just witnessed the whole thing from top of his balcony. And it was just, I don't know. I don't know how much he saw, right? But I think he would have saw something. And he must have just like, I fucking love in this, mate. This is better than Netflix, this. I hey, love, you seen this? Get the cans out. You know what I mean? It's like 10 o'clock at night. So he must have been... He must have felt something that he needed to call the ambulance. And then at that time, some lady just came out house and then she was looking at me. She goes, did you have a ha accident? <laughs> I'm like, mm. it was odd how she would ask me that question. Like, I don't know why she didn't want to look at my hands or my face. I don't know. So I went, can I just use your phone? I called my friends up. I told them to come turn up. They turned up and when they turned up, uh, they were in shock. They were in total shock about absolutely everything that was happening and then that's when they called me a soldier boy <laughs> it's, it just it just changed that direction towards what they would call me because they always had a nickname for me they knew my first name but they still had a nickname because you know you you english fucking love a nickname mate you fucking love a nickname for everything there's nickname <laughs> for everything there's about seventeen thousand smudges in the army mate and they all got a second name smith you know it's a smudge smudge which one? That one. Oh, right, got ya. Yeah, but it's just how it is. But um, so that happened. The ambulance turned up. I passed out an ambulance eventually. I woke up. I remember seeing my mom and <laughs> my parents and that. And I don't know what to tell them, you know. Because um, for the first six, seven years that the child was in this country, he gets spat up, bitten, he started to take drugs, he got kicked out of school for whatever reason it was be, and somebody just tried to fucking murder him. So, to them it was very disturbing. I understand that. So to them it was very deep, and like, this is not why you brought me here, I understand that, and so, and this is not what, it's, I just felt very, Embarrassed. I felt so embarrassed. What did your mother say to you? Who's going to pay for your car insurance? <laughs> She's deep. <laughs> You're not going to get a job now. <laughs> like, come on, calm down, mama. I'm like, mom, not now. <laughs> Dark humor. And my dad just, my dad is just, my dad just knew, he knew something was up. And, um, he just knew he didn't need to say much. His look is enough for me. So did they find the guy who did this? So when I passed out, I woke up in the hospital a couple of days later, police turned up and they were like, yeah, my name is DC Plod, whatever my name is. Um, yeah, we've arrested an individual and um, he told us that you were selling Class A drugs and he was there to buy Class A drugs from you. And therefore, because you was there both... Uh, uh, um, conducting the criminal action and criminal uh, exchange, therefore we we can't really press no charges. Like, I I don't know if that's true. I don't know how true this is. If I were to go and rob a drug dealer who ends up in the hospital, but say he wakes up and he's got an eye missing, for example, and but they come and arrest me. I said I was there to rob him. He's a drug dealer, right? I don't know if I'll get away with it though. No, I I don't know that. I wasn't concerned because I don't know whether they're concerned, whether or not. I just went to listen, man. He's going to go and kill someone. Go and uh, pick up that body when he, when he does that. See you later. Some blokes turned up to me and just saying to me, we can, we can get a strap if you want and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fuck off. It's not that I, I was not even thinking about doing it. Honestly, still to this day, right, I don't feel like I wanted to hurt him immediately. 
of like the nothing of that sort was in my full process. Thanks for watching our podcast. Is with my sponsor. It's AG1 by Athletic Greens. With Jem being pregnant, some days she wakes up in a good mood. Some days she points at the belly and screams at me, "You did this to me!" But with AG1, it puts me in a better mood. Thankfully for Sean. <laughs> AG1 has been a part of millions of mornings since 2010. AG1 gives me increased energy and mood support. It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. My body is my temple and with AG1, I take good care of my body every day. Why take a bunch of things when you can just have athletic greens, one scoop of powder in water every day? If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, athletic greens is giving you a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-M. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean. Check it out. That's the word from our sponsor. Thanks for watching. Link in the description box below this video for AG1. I was digging deep into my existence and I was on morphine that time and I was all over the place. I lost loads of weight because I needed to prepare for surgery and so on. And, and I, I was just thinking about things and what's happening and why and because and there's a variety of elements. And then I just, I needed to do something. So I need to, I need to go and get myself into a reasonable employment and get on with my life and have some sort of, uh, be a productive member of our society, should I say, you know, and and because I can be, and I have a lot more than I let people know. Even in the army, I didn't tell them half of the stuff, like my grandfather's pa, that the World War One. I, 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 I'm just not out there to, to. It was not necessary. Even some men in the army right now message me. I said I didn't even know you got stabbed before. Like I, I wasn't. I'm not going to advertise something, but I've always advertised in the army that I'm from Azerbaijan. Like, there was no way I was never going to say that at all. Like, I would love that bit. And it, 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 I kind of related to some of them and most of them, it was okay. But when I was in the hospital at that time, I was just sat there and I just needed to evaluate my entire existence. And by going to university, it wouldn't have done me any favors because I knew I still was in the, in, in the round environment. So I needed to get away from this area. I just needed to get away from England, get away from, from, from London, get away from all of them, everything. Just I needed to go and try to be around different people and do different things. So I joined the army. Do, you, do, you, do you credit then him slashing your throat with forcing you to go inside yourself to turn your well, life as around? In, as in, yeah, I, I believe that. I, I, I have to uh, acknowledge that too. That was a, because if that wasn't me, I could be in prison and uh, I don't know how I can cope in prison. You know, I, I can't take orders from people. Like in the army is different. I joined the army, I know how to take fucking orders from my sergeant major. Yeah, not some fucking red ass lunch jack who thinks he's got dogs fucking bollocks, but sergeant major, sergeant, color sergeant, captain, uh, yes sir, no problem. You know what I mean? Get executed. But in a, in a prison, I just don't think I'll be able to handle somebody telling me I own this fucking wing. You do what I fucking say. I'll be like, no, I'm dying. I have to go into isolation or I have to die or I have to, to just, I don't know how violent I have to be for everyone to leave me alone because I'm not, I don't really like men. You know, I don't, I found it very difficult to make friends with men in general because of the school in this country. You know, you genuinely fucking spat in my face, motherfuckers. Do you know what I mean? You called me a fucking immigrant, Albanian, car, whatever you did, refugee, whatever you could find. You still can't pronounce my country to the date. And believe it, I will be there. I'll be like, and again, and again, and again. And I will sit there until you pronounce my country. Just because I can. Yeah, and I know you can't. But I won't do it to everyone. And I don't do it to everyone. I don't have that mindset. I'm not inclined to try to humiliate people or diminish them. Or try to highlight to them that I have a superior social class. I'm an intellectually superior to you. I just don't find that uh, helpful or even positive in life. You know, believe me, other people who cannot read and write got other skills to bring to the table. We just don't know what they are because we just think they don't fucking got fuck all going for them. Some of them have, but not all of them the same. So him doing that, it triggered a lot of positivity in my life. I get that. I get that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to thank him for that, but certain events trigger certain events in people's life and then events have consequences, you know? So 
whatever I chose to do then, it had consequences on me. So how was basic training going in? Oh, I, I, I was in love with some girl during the basic training. She broke up with me a week before I started. I don't know what she wanted me to fail or something. <laughs> I don't know why, why women sometimes do these things, mate. Uh, anyway, so it was just karma for me because um, when I was with this girl that when I was stabbed, she was really took, looked after me and she really loved me and stuff like that. But she held me back because I really wanted to go to, to the army, but she was so in love with me. She's like, no, you're not going to go. You're going to die. I don't you want you to. She just wanted me there. We lived together and everything. Yeah. And I was like, no, I, I, I needed to fucking move on. So at this point, from the minute I got stabbed, right, until 2018, that's from 2821. Uh, 2000, what, six, seven, eight? From 2007 to 2018, I've never, t I, t I didn't take any drugs. So I was not smoking weed or anything like that. And I, I've never failed any drug tests in the army. I'm not, I'm not tramp like that. Did not join the army to take sniff. So I, I was clean anyway. I stopped weed be two years before I joined the army. So it's not like I had drugs preventing me from progressing. I was not addicted to, to anything. And if I was addicted, the addiction can be, can be, can, can be dealt with according to my environment and the way I operate mentally. So I didn't think that drugs had any significant impact on my detrimental society, detrimental existence, you know? But him d doing that, it did trigger positive events. And then I moved on. I nearly didn't get into the army, by the way. I had to go through extra evaluation on my hands and they need to make sure I can do press ups and things like that. They had to go get deep, whatever, to check my blood because like if you got diseases in your blood, that's a medical condition, you can't enter the army because you can't do blood transfusion or everything. Like, so I got lucky. So I got in, I got in, I went to the basic training and it was nothing but northerners. At this point, <laughs> at this point in my life, I didn't know that these people exist to this level. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm um, all around Southerners, yeah, London's everything. I've not, I, I heard the Northerners on the telly, you know, uh, and I support Man United, so that's typical. I'm from London, but now I'm from Azerbaijan, support, but yeah, I can do that. It's okay. And I go over there, and there's like Manx, Judas, Yorkshire lads, West Yorkshire, Bolton, Oldham, Liverpool, like South Shields. I'm not supposed to know where South Shields is. Do you know where that is? I still don't. It's, know. it's, Put it this way, it's Newcastle and further. It's there. You know, there's some Scottish boys, the Irish boys, all these different people come from the British Isles that I did not know any true extent of existence. And I learned from them. I asked them, I would ask them deep questions about Manchester, Oldham, Yorkshire. I'm into that stuff. I'm into doing social experiments and asking people about their existence. And then I got to know them and they're friendly. So it helped me out. It helped me out because they were friendly. I think if I were to join my latter, uh, my, my later battalion as a red crow bag, as a, as a red ass with my foreign name, I would have had much more difficulties to integrate, yeah, in the Southern Battalion. I, I, I'm aware of that now. So I got lucky. I, got into the, I went to 2RF, 2nd Battalion, Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. I got there to Germany. I remember my Sergeant Major Irving as a Geordie lad. I'm telling you, he's got about 30 fucking medals on his chest, mate. His medals, probably heavier than him. He's about <laughs> five foot two, weighs about 60 kg, yeah? It, it literally has no muscle mass. I don't know how he survives. He survives. He's a sergeant major and I'm a crow bag and he's right there. Right, fellas, you're brand new in the battalion. This is what you're going to do. You keep your fucking head down. You do what you're fucking told. Turn up at the right time. Blah, 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 blah. Don't take the fucking piss. You get fucking ironed out. If anything, blah, blah, blah. And who here likes boxing? Sir, I know how to box. It's like, right, you get into battalion team. You get into a company team. There's company into boxing coming up. You, as a red ass, gonna, gonna fight. Let's go. Hurry up. Let's go. Gone. I went straight into the boxing, yeah? And Keelan Walker and his team in A Company 2RF, they, um, I like boxing because it's me, yeah? I don't need to rely on my teammates, my left back, my fucking goalkeeper. So you go into the boxing? So, right, yeah, so I turned up and then Sergeant Major Irving just like, yep, yeah, be part of the team, represent uh, 
A company in, in Tupatale. Are you any good though? I'm, I'm all right, sir. Yeah. Tony Petit, if nobody knows, but now you know, Tony Petit from the Nemesis Gym in Erif. They're not based there anymore. They're, I think they believe they're based in, in Crayford. But anyway, Tony Petit has taught me fundamental basics of boxing, right? When I used to go and train at his gym. So those fundamental basic skills that I have that he gave me in my early development stages in this society, right? Um, I took into the army and I was like, sir, I can box. Yeah, I know. And, and at that time, I'm like, I'm a fatty. Like, I'm a fatty. Like, I'm, I've always liked cake. I eat really good food, but I would eat a fucking free ice creams. And I will, <laughs> I will not care. I would eat free ice creams. So that's where my fatness came from in general. And I turned up a little bit fat and whatnot. Within seven weeks, I was at 64 kg, 64.7 kg when I weighed on the fight night. And I fought in front of the whole battalion. And that was the most like amazing feeling I could ever have. Because that like... That's me integrated into my battalion now. They were sitting there and they were screaming, mad dog, mad dog. It, it was crazy, drums, it was so much noise. It was like, I didn't anticipate so much level of noise for that event. It was into battalion boxing competition and it was like it was at a fucking O2 arena. <laughs> and, it, and it's not for me, like it was just for every fight, every fighter. So... The reason they called me Mad Dog, it was because Keelan Walker, <laughs> like my 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 my, my, uh, my name at that time in the in, in um in the army was Manatov, right? So that's my my, my natural uh, give birth in name, a uh, birth given name, okay? And they can't pronounce it. With not, it's not Madatov. It's not like the, the M and A and D and A in English language doesn't sound the same as it would be Nazari or... Not Molotov cocktail. Yeah, it's not Molotov, mate. There you go again. There's another one. <laughs> Is it Manatov? There's another one. It's Madatov. Madatov. Yeah, Madatov. Mad. Yeah, yeah. Mad dog. Yes. So because they couldn't pronounce my second name, because in the army it's all about second name terms, it's name rank number. Killing Walker's like, I ain't going to call you whatever that is, um, I can call you my dog because just the way you are in the ring and the way you are outside of here, you just, you're just a bit mad at times, aren't you? I'm like, no, I'm not mad. I'm just defensive because people give me banter. I don't know how to interpret that banter and I will be verbally responsive in a negative manner. Most of the time, I get very defensive because I now on my own I have to fight and fend for myself I need to take orders I need to try to integrate into this battalion full of fucking men of war these boys being in 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 in, in, um, in Germany only about nine months they just got back from Hanslow that, that fully operational tour the, the unit had suffered casualties yeah and then when they got back Southeast Asians in Hanslow spat at them while they fucking paraded for the country, yeah? Like, when I found this out, right, and I was just like, in my country, they can never do that. We just cut the balls off and deport them all. And that's the end of that. You can't come to my land, kill our soldiers, spit out our army, uh, and, and molest our children and women and think we're not going to do nothing. Regardless which social BAME community you're from, you get dealt with significantly and severely. And I'm proud of that. I love that fact that I will use all the all the necessary tactics. It's necessary to eliminate that threat that is a threat to our children, our society. So that's me. That's the way I operate, and I'm don't really negotiate with people like that. And they got they got to the unit, and I just me, just some random bloke. Just I was selling drugs not long ago. Someone tried to murder me, and I come from the land of fire. Who am I to them? Like I understood. The, the, the magnitude of my existence in that environment, which was very insignificant. I'm at the bottom of entire economic and social ladder in the British Army from the minute I walked in the 2RF. So, and I did well. I did well. They liked me. They are boxed. I've lost. I won. I went on exercises with them. I, I, I went to, I did, I did Cambrian Patrol. That's one of my greatest achievements in the Army. It's, I got gold medal for that in, with two RF reconnaissance team. And I was part of the last reconnaissance team in two PWRR, in two, in two RRF, two of complete Cambry patrol. 
and got the gold medal. Like, we are the last blokes for 2 RF because then after that got dismantled and we had to go into to different paths. But, um, and I was the one of the last soldiers to get an NCO card and pass as a 2 RF soldier. So, um, I love 2 RF in it because they showed me love. And um, not everyone understand that I banged a couple of people. The couple of people banged me. And I get though that it's fine. To me, army was like a prison. But you're getting paid for. You get freedom when they tell you to get freedom. And you get to travel to places. I The way I looked at the army, it wasn't how some people might look at the army. I certainly wasn't there to go out there and start blowing people's heads off. I would if it's in certain circumstances dictate, but that wasn't my main thought process. I was not in the army to to, 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 to cause anyone any harm, mainly to do to get away from my environment and and better myself. And I like challenges and I like competing with men. I like I personally will never be competing with a woman. There is not a single woman I've ever come across in my life that is stronger than me in any single physical way. Period. Yeah? And I will never comp compete with women. I can't. I don't compete with women. But I like to compete with men who are better than me. Yeah? So when I get in the ring, and if you're better than me, I want to fight you. Just so I don't want to know how fucking good you are. Literally, I want to find out. Yeah. Yeah, I will find out. And then if you hurt me, so what? I'll go in the ring myself. That's the way I operate. So joining the army, I've literally just had to take examples and compete with these men. And some of them were fucking athletes. I can't do nothing about it. The kid runs seven mile and a half in seven minutes. I can't compete with that. I'm not even going to. But it's okay. I'm, I was there standing next to him. And I'm like, fucking hell. You're, a, you, you, you're on fire, you know. You're athletically gifted, you know. And so my initial stages was, it was his integration into 2RF just because of the boxing and my personality, everybody knows me. Like I've got to know, I must have spoken to every member of a 600 battalion unit, apart from the one of the highest officers, like the colonel and, you know, battalion to our CNO, because I don't see how I should be having a conversation with them about anything, unless I'm given orders. So um, 2RF was lovely, got my NCO card done, and then we got be again dismantled and... Um, I needed to transfer and was based at, in Cyprus at that moment. And I've decided that I want to stay in Cyprus mainly to the financial reasons. Plus, it was two PWR that come in there. I don't know who they are. Well, I do know who, the, who they are, but I um, not really anticipated what I would experience coming later because, but I knew that if I were to get promoted in with two RF, it, I wouldn't need to be promoted with 2PWR because I probably would be at the bottom ladder of their promotional course because I'm a new bloke from a different unit. And to them, it's just like being straight out of training. Yeah, you own your fucking ranks, yeah? Own your stripes, mate. Anyway, so I got to 2PWR. Uh, but bear in mind that um, there's one thing I missed out, actually. It's, it's very significant. So I did the boxing in 2RF. And then we prep for deployment and we went to Kenya. And then that's when James Wilkinson got killed. So James Wilkinson, he was in a training with me in the same platoon training. And there's a 20 year old kid from Manchester. And there was an individual that were unloading the weapon. And um, when they were unloading the weapon, there was a round that got stuck in the chamber. It's a normal, there's normal drills to be carried out. There's a set of drills that you need to do to anticipate this. And they failed to anticipate this. The round cooked off and it killed him instantly, right? And then the whole exercise stopped. I remember everyone screaming, stop. And this was not to stop, to stop exercise, not end X. This is to stop because something fucking happened. And everybody knew it was just so silent suddenly. I can see everyone's faces and it was just a sad moment for me. Like It was a real re realization for me that um, I could have been lying there. It could have been weapon behind me. I am just had to highlight that to, to guys around us in training, like bellies and stuff. I'm like, man, look, man, this is so weird. Just sometimes it's so weird for me. Like, I just don't don't anticipate these things. And it's just, it's just sad. But it's just a realization of life. And that's when it hit me. Plus, I, I think I, I'm a little bit more mature sometimes 
then I, I behave and sometimes I behave very mature but I always have an old soul so I, I genuinely feel that um, it's sad it's just things like that very sad did it make you reflect again to some extent I had to call my parents up and just kind of tell them the truth now <laughs> I'm in the army now mate so you didn't tell your parents you were there no they knew I was in the army but I that's when I've called them up and said to them, I'm in the army now Dad. you've been deployed yeah like I'm in Kenya and this kid got killed so to them it's like, but they know this stuff and they were raised by people that survived war they don't need to tell me anything my dad done national service and he never never, never got enlisted to go and fight the first second Karabakh war because he was older then so I got lucky that my dad never died or you know anyway so moving on from that um 2RF was great. I loved it. I loved most of the people in there. I was in the mortars. I was in recce. I wasn't in recce like permanently, but nevertheless, I was still like them. They like me. And I was in support company and people know me. People knew me already. They, they, um, like some people, not everyone's going to have anything good to say about me. I get that. But at least I was always there. I'll turn up. I'll pull shift in. I had morals. I have principles. And uh, I had dignity, you know, and I'm always been from Azerbaijan and they're comfortable with that, you know, they could relate to that. There was no need to, there was no, I didn't feel any significant racial abuse from being in the armed forces in general from anyone, because I'm really honest, like, you know what I mean? And most of these boys that do have a brain, they do have intelligence and they know that there's other countries in the world. And, you know, some of these boys never left England and they expanded the horizon by joining the army. So it's a significant stage in my life. And then 2RF, uh, 2RF got disbanded and then 2PW came. And it was difficult for me in 2PW. First of all, I was new, didn't know anyone. And then I just started receiving some fucking stick. I don't know why and how and because. And I would just give it fucking back, mate. And trust me when I say I give it back, like... I'll always give it back from, especially when I, like, listen, I can take orders and I can execute an objective if necessary, like, but I don't, don't see how you need to start like, diminishing me or discriminating against me or giving me a hard time because you think I'm not meeting the standards or perhaps that I'm just different or because I gob off or because of this or whatever it may be. So my integration in 2PWR was very difficult for me. Plus it adds on to my my depression that I, I, I suffered like any normal man or just like I'm by myself. I'm still by myself. Like at all this time, people failing to understand that I'm still by myself. I might, some of them might be my friends, but they're not my, like, my best bros. I don't go out and drinking with them. I don't drink. I'll stay in my room most of the time and read books. I'll go to the beach. I'll go to the gym. And like my entire existence since I got stabbed until pretty much now, it's been by myself. Everything I've done now, everything that I have now is without any influence from any outside party whatsoever. There is nobody in my pocket. I'm in nobody's pocket. Nobody tells me anything, all right? So everything I have now is because of me, right? So, and that's the same in the army. I'm not very social with men. Like, I've just, I'm just not. It's very few men that I could get on with, especially those men who don't find me as a threat, right? So those that find me as a threat, they will, they, whatever it may be, it's just natural. Like, being a man is difficult as it is. Being a man in a competitive world, it's also challenging. Because when you fail, army is brutal. The, the, the failures will be presented to you. You're a fucking shit. Get a fucking grip. And I appreciate that. I appreciate those words. Those words need to be spoken. I wish men would say this to their fucking children when you're 13 and 14 year old. Especially if they're sons. Believe it. It does them a great deal of good because if your son comes to my child and he's 20 for whatever reason it may be and because you haven't given him any discipline in that and he hurts my child, your son's fucked, mate. You know what I mean? And it has to be, naturally. Like, you men have to dis defend our women and children. It's imperative for us to do that. It's like beyond people's conceptualization that the hate you give to children fucks everybody. So if you give your child the hate and they grow up, yeah, it's still your child, but I will kill it if it comes and harms my family. And I have to. 
And if people don't think anything otherwise, then what kind of man are you really are if you're not capable or or or, or, or even thought, thinking about defending your family to that level? Because it's not you, especially if it's injustice, you know. Like random children die every day right now, and their mum and dad don't do nothing about it. Man, those the, the children who were raised by those people, they should be. You know what I mean, but Jen, that's me. Jen was just saying the other day, she'd kill anyone, wouldn't you, if anyone tried to? Uh, oh you, God, I'll, I'll tell yeah. you what, right? Yeah, people don't even know this. So there's a guy called Robert Sapolsky, right? And he's a neuroscientist from Stanford University, and it's free education on the internet, and his books are amazing. There's one of his books called Behave, right? And he talks about neurotransmitters and neuroscience in a more intricate way. By the way, that new neuroscience is a new field. It's about 40, 50 years old. They're not absolutely fuck all about it. So whatever they know, they told us now, right? And he, he, he clearly says that, that estrogen triggers aggression in a female when she protects her offspring, yeah? And that aggression, yeah, cannot be matched, right? Like seriously, it's some <laughs> natural human universal chemical that the bond between the mother and child it can it, it can never rev, it can never be replicated by any other chemical energy on the universe, right? Yeah, and so most of our aggression is not even triggered by testosterone; it triggers by our environment of the past and how we behave to certain experiences and times. Yeah, and in in the future years, if the same happened to you, you you behave in the same way, in aggressive or not aggressive manner, right? But I'm just letting you know the chemical between mother and the child is is very important. You're feeling because, it, Jen. Yeah, lioness. No. Lioness. There you go. There you go. Be proud. <laughs> and the PWR was difficult, and I didn't anticipate it, but I kind of thought it might be the Southern Battalion. You know, they had it on its own uh, challenges. You know, and. And I got very depressed into PWR at one point, mate. And they won't promote me for ages. They would not promote me for fucking ages. And the longer they will take, the less and less productive I become. The more depressed I become. The more aggressive I become. And it's not like I'm aggressive to everyone. I just blatantly did not give a fuck if you fucking like me or not. And it's just, just the way it, it, it was in my environment then. Okay? And then one day, I don't know what happened. I still don't know what the fuck happened, why and how, okay. But I just decided that I want to become a physical training instructor. And uh, they promoted me like a couple of weeks afterwards. I was just like, I'm going on, on a PTI car. And I went, I did, I got it. I went to Aldershot, I passed the course, I came back. And um, it was the best thing I've ever did in the armed forces is by far the most enjoyable element of my career yeah and i can't i can't never replace that i have literally trained men 300 men just lining up there listening to my execution of orders how to do exercises and it was so enjoyable I, it was the best thing ever and i was so happy because before that right the pwr first promoted me right and they moved me from support company straight to A company while I was on leave. I didn't know that until I got back. And it completely um, destabilized my direction and my aim in my head. And I couldn't deal with it. I didn't want to go to a different company in a rifle company as a brand new lance jack. And I didn't even know them. And they didn't like me. And I'm, I'm just like, fuck off. You know, it's just like, it's like that. Like, I even had a fight with some private after we got back from Belize. It was, just, it, it got to me like that. Like uh, nobody liked me now. Even the chain of command or Sergeant Major fucking make comments and fucking dirty little fucking But anyway, and then some OC was, uh, it was just fucking pissed me off because I was very proud, right? And there was no need for them to be like that. But whatever it may be, maybe they had their own reasons, whatever it may be, I'm not bitter. I'm just stating the existence of my story so that's what happened and then I, I remember once and I got demoted so I got promoted got moved and we went to Belize I got back from Belize and I got demoted right I got demoted because I discharged a weapon in a, in a, in a cockpit in the cockpit fucking in the unloading bay and that was in a, that was a, a sequence of events that led up to that 
that if you compile them together, it highlights on my report that I was very incompetent uh, being a leader of men. Fine, I'll take that on the fucking chin, right? Demote me, but get me the fuck out of this company, right? And that's why I demand, I, I stress why I do not want to be with your company. Get me out of it. They move me back to support company and I was just stagnated. I was hating life because I really wanted to get promoted and it was really good. Like, I, I enjoy this stuff, right? I enjoy rising up, right? You know what I mean? I could crash down, but I still enjoy the progression that I'm making in life. And um, here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A U R A forward slash Sean Atwood, S H A U N A T T Wood, to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. So they got me through that. And I went to the support company and then I was, I was very depressed at very early stages. And that's when I just suddenly changed. I don't know what happened. I can't understand what happened, what triggered it or what not. All right. I just wanted to become a PTI. So I kept pestering, pestering, pestering. I got promoted again about nine months later. And I went to PTI card, I come back and everyone thought I'd be the same person as I was before as that aggressive abu like power abusive lance corporal that I was, okay? And no, I wasn't. I was the opposite. And it was the best thing ever. They loved it. They loved it. I had people turning up to my lessons and telling me that I'm looking forward to your lesson. You know, I had people telling me that they no longer on the biff. They stopped going off sick and all that. It was just present feedback. I became a battalion to I see when I got to Cottesmore and that was it. It was, it was just, it was just great. I, I ended up proving myself to, to PWR that I was worthy to have the cap badge, right? And that's one thing really, like I have this pride in me and this pride is reflected within my service and within the men around me. And I perhaps, yeah, they fall like, who is this bloke turning up? You better wear that cap badge with pride. And I understand that. I never disagreed with that concept. You know, it's just maybe they, conception of what that pride means was different to mine P uh, maybe what had the perceived who I, who I was and how I am you know but when they got to know my true skills and and got to know me it was it was much easier but early stages was challenging in general because life is challenging like you get challenges is how you deal with them I didn't ask for nothing like this I knew I had to join the army and you know but when I was in 2 in 2BWR, we had John Fernandez that got killed and he got killed by one of our blokes, right? Just drink driving incident and RIP to John, he was a, a very gentle man. But um, it, it, it was a shock, right? That, but it wasn't, I didn't find it like abnormal. Drink driving happens, it's a common, it's a common theme in the armed forces, unfortunately. Blokes die a lot just from drink driving. It's just so sad how you'd waste your life like that. But he died. He was it was it was involved in the car. It was walking down the street. He wasn't the driver. He wasn't in the vehicle. It was an other bloke in the car driving towards and they just hit him on the pedestrian and they killed him instantly. So it's just sad. Uh, that guy got punished anyway. But Army has his own challenges like the murder of Lee Rigby. I don't know why. I have no, I still don't know why I really got impacted by his death, right? But there could be a variety of elements that contributes towards that. Mainly to do that, I'm not far from Woolwich. Yeah, I used to use that barracks just to train when I'm on annual leave. And in the, in the manner it happened, and all to do with my Islamic background and everything, it was just so deep for me. Like watching that, that 
fucking cockroach standing again. iPhone, i242. He ain't even got no fucking teeth, mate. Have you seen his teeth? They're fucking rotten. It was disgusting. I couldn't understand it. And literally, I was in Cyprus at this moment. I was not in London, right? I, I don't know how I would have behaved if I was in London. Maybe it blessed me because I also was, I was in uh, somewhere else while I was in the army when the riots happened. So I was not in the country when there's two significant, that, that significant uh, event happened. But we, re we automatically, the whole entire British army received significant orders from the top saying, you stand down. Like they, they, they went in, they went in on us on this. There's like, you don't fucking do anything here. It was so fucking, I've never seen our uh, commanding officers giving us like, such a like direct, strict orders. It was deep. It was beyond me. I've never seen the army behaving like that. And I felt like we we're going to go to war. I genuinely believe that, you know, and <clears throat> it was just, I don't know why he needed to die. So what was the circumstances surrounding Lee Rigby's murder? He was walking down the street and it was, so I don't know Lee Rigby personally, as in he's not a friend of mine and he wouldn't see if he were to see me in the manor or on an, in the battalion, he'd call my name out and say hello to me and find out how my, my life is. None of that. He, he didn't go to Cyprus. He went straight to the recruitment center from Germany and we went to Cyprus. So I'm just sitting there and I see all the news. And then and then straight away, because it's people knew, so his name was not said, all right? But people noticed his face. And then straight away in the unit, straight away everyone said, this is Lee, that's Lee, right? And he's in drums platoon. And I was in mortars platoon at that point, And I was in a support company and it was deep impact on those boys. And I just see them. I I cried I cried for him and I felt very sad that and it was just it just felt so close to me I mean I live a mile and a half away from Woolwich so I could have easily like been that guy walking down that street and those two Nigerians would have run me over and tried to cut my head off and unfortunately it isn't me who 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 be feeling the pain of it you know. I'd be dead by then, but I, 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 people find it odd to understand. I live under a completely different social belief system. You know, my cultural belief systems is different. I don't, iPhone, I will make sure your whole fucking family is blind. And I'm not the one that's going to make your family blind first. You have to make our member blind. You know, we know how to do things diplomatically, but I don't see how I'm going to just randomly walk up to some random child and cut their head off. I don't see how I'm going to do that. Yeah, so that there, it just, it broke me. It just broke me because it was so close to my home. My mom's called me up. You know, did you know what happened in Woolwich? Those fucking scumbags. Where, where are you? I'm like, mom, because, because I never tell my mom and dad where I'm based. Right, I just I just told them I'm in the army. They 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 they're concerned, but they're not. They don't they don't get to talk. I don't I don't discuss um, operational stuff with my family. I just tell them I'm here or I'm there. But at that time, she really wanted to know. But it happened, you know, and uh, I can like, so the man. That is responsible for it. They 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 they've done that. But there's another guy called Ajum Chaudhry. So he's the one of the main perpetrators. But he's not done no physical perpetrating. He's just been screaming Islamophobia at every who just says something to him. But in general, he's just like from this. I don't know what we primitive background is from. He's from Southampton. Claims to be a Muslim, and he's got brown teeth. That's all you need to know about him. But um, these people still exist. They're alive. Their family is still alive. I don't understand how the society doesn't deport these people from this country. I don't, I'm confused about that. I will never feed the children of terrorists, point blank. I don't care who's terrorist. Mate, my ancestors killed Nazi children. We wiped them, we killed, we executed them, all of them. We did not let them leave, you know. We was not going to be concerned about their babies and the children. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's the war and that's the way I, in my head, behave, you know. This is the way I operate. And it's just sad. It's just sad how 
the 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 consequences and 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 the repercussions are not severe like to me it just has to be full on deportation of thousands of people on a massive scale and that that's just just the way it is i'm sorry i don't come to england to tell you that it's a terribly white balcony like i'm not a primitive tribe member you see plus i don't know how ugly people can say that stuff like that you know it's just if you can't say that about my people you you can't go to house of Saudis to jeddah and say that you will never return you will never return believe it believe it you will never return let you be i'll be surprised if you're alive if they ever hear you speak again right that's the world and then you can't just go to saudi arabia and invade them <laughs> you ain't gonna happen all right and that's an example no, you can't go to Persia and say anything. You can't go to Turkey. You certainly won't be standing in Russia and saying stuff like that now, right? You can say something pro-Ukraine, I dare you. But let alone say terribly white Kremlin, I dare you. You know, that's the basic examples of what I could dig up, dig up and, and, and see across from me. And I understand social disparities. I understand some people just disappointed that history is not favored them or maybe they're bitter because history is not theirs or because they're not in the history the way they want to be in the history. Well, it's not happening. You're not in my history. There's a fucking reason for that. Yeah? That's what you want me to do about it. I, 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 you can't come to my country, rewrite our history. It's a declaration of war. Like Egypt now suing Netflix over Cleopatra. They're going to destroy them. They're going to... Do you know how much money is being pumped to that legal team? They, they're going to take away Netflix and they're going to do as much humiliation and damage. Pretty much like the Germany got humiliated in World War I. That's what's happening to America now. And Netflix because of that. And it's going to be more. They're going to, not going to stop, mate. I'm, and I'm there with them. So they're going to get rid of Netflix? They're going to bankrupt them because they're going to take them to court because they falsified the image of Cleopatra. Right? And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, you be survived. We're going to create the Arab version. You can watch yeah, that. Yeah, the Arab version. Yeah, we'll get the Arab version with proper clear parts. <laughs> 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 they look properly too. <laughs> but that's the prime examples of the, the challenges I see that's happening in the United Kingdom as a society. And I do not think like you lot. I'm not from your country. This is not my country. It never was and never will be. I'm from the land of fire, but to use Azerbaijan. So you better say it correctly, not just not to everyone, but to certain people. And I'll be exercising that my rights because English gave the world the freedom. I didn't, not my people. Uh, the, you're, you're, you're one of the key players to contribute to the freedom of the world. Not to mention you're the only player that eliminated slavery. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't stop slavery until 1924 because of you. You literally dismantled Ottoman Empire and sent the order to Jeddah and Mecca and Medina and told all the Ottoman Empire and all the, uh, the third parties that were politically controlled by the Ottomans that you see slave trading right now or will destroy you to some extent. And they come to the realization it's time to move forward in humanity and get rid of the slave trade. That's what happened. We got told we didn't do by ourselves. We didn't have 1772 Lord Mansfield telling us in the middle of Jeddah or Bet Medina saying uh, the, 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 the English land is too pure for any man to be a slave. You can be a criminal, but never a slave. That was 1772 he said that. And he freed Somerset. He was a black slave from slavery. 1772. Do you know what we were doing to slaves in 1772? Male slaves are not allowed to have sex in a Muslim world. You made flat at the belly. They, they, they would literally castrate you. And that was not under morphine and that. You're not lying down and that. They're not snipping you straight against the fucking stone. And you're all lined up. And then you have to march with your shackles to the, to the slave market. And then they put you somewhere. You know, first slave uprising, a recorded uprising in a Muslim world it's 9th century, Baghdad, Iraq, sugar plantation and salt mines in Iraq. Did you know there were sugar plantations in Iraq? I didn't. I, I didn't know that until I started to dig deep into my history of people because the, I read books in a different language too. And your, your version of history is glorifying you. My version of history is glorifying us. But when we write contradictory history of one another, that's the truth. And it comes from us about us and yous about yous. Like, um... What's that guy called debunking history? I forgot his name. Simon Webb is one of the history. Nobody even listens to him sometimes. They think he's a lunatic, all right? But some of the stuff is right about the English concentration camp. 
in, 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 in how you had German soldiers here, 30,000 of them. You didn't know what to do with them. They were stuck at East London docks. They were just sitting there in concentration camps. Well, in camps. They were prisoners of war. And they used to walk around England and just clean up all the rubble from the Germans' bombardment. And then they deported them all back. They didn't know what to do with them. Like, you know, and that all, it, it, it's all one of those elements. And what happened in Africa and, 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 and um, the Boer War and so on. He tells me this stuff, right? I'm not going to be learning this stuff. We should not be teaching our kids about slavery. Not in school. They need to grow up, yeah? They need to grow up and go and seek their own knowledge, right? Because knowledge, the aim of knowledge is truth, right? Knowledge does not invent facts. should present them, right? But you, you, we preventing, we're inventing facts for children. Hey, then you went around five continents. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that, what you saw. So Kenya was great. I've never been to Africa before until the British Army took me there. So I really saw the most deprived area of the world, lack of infrastructure. Uh, but there was social stability in terms of, I just see they just operated differently a little bit, you know? Yeah, and I just see there was, uh, there's certain things you can take away from Kenya. And there's certain things you won't be part of. But um, Kenya in general was nice. There was not, it was really hard exercise for me. James Wilkinson got killed too. But in general, it was a physical element of it. Oh, we had hyenas following us. We walked in and, 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 and in the middle of the night, we're just walking there and there's the lions just eating something and we're just walking back quietly. People on the radio saying to walk back quietly, walk back, walk, do not turn your back, walk back. Because we always had a, a local, um, uh, just the local navigator, the, 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 the safari navigator. And only our sergeant had the life bullets at that time during that patrol specifically. So we were just standing there in blank, seeing lions eating things. And we're just like, well, what's going on here? Like I questioned my life sometimes in Kenya because it was so challenging because certain things, I, I put myself through so much paces. Like I'm surprised that I've, I was surprised when I did Cambry Patrol and I passed the gold gold medal. I was just like, I'm I just, it's a really significant moment for me, you know? What it's, challenged you the most in Kenya? In Kenya, just the environment, the terrain. Like, and, and I was also a brand new soldier. So I still had a lot to learn, man. You, you like, get the fuck up. Why are you falling asleep standing up and shit? You know, like everything that contributes, like I didn't know what was going on with my body. How do I feel in certain moments, in certain environments, under certain conditions? And now everything was being molded for me. Like it was all new, all new. Even w walking around with an eyesight, night sight, in the middle of the night, when it's all sweating and it's all that just just blurry and then you just all your helmet is all over the place it's just this like all these things right that all the all the hardest elements of existence as a soldier when you're learning things and things are hard and you're on a patrol with blokes and some of them you just look at how the fuck are you like this why are you even so fresh why are you smiling stop smiling you know you, you, you'd want them to feel bad that but they don't because they're, they're senior soldiers I've been there before, so I walk in the park. I was like that seven years later, not seven months, not seven weeks. You know, army is something that you need to understand. You can't just achieve things flat out and quickly. Experience above everything, right? It's like wisdom of old people. You know, don't disregard old people. They're no more than you. They got there before you even know how to get there. You don't even know if you're going to get there, you little prick. <laughs> Fucking shut up and listen. Listen to your grandparents, you know. They raised your mum and dad. That they know something that you don't know that they had to teach your mum and dad, you know? So it's a very significant like that. What was your favourite continent? Well, my favourite continent, oh, Belize was nice. Belize was nice. We did proper, well, I don't know how true this is, but the local guide who, who helped us to guide because there were like um, snakes and stuff like that and vermin that would just kill you. But he said, there's a, there's a jaguar following you, lot. Like, oh, what, <laughs> what do you mean? Just following us. Yeah, he picked up on your scent and he's following you, but you, you won't be able to see him. What do you mean? We want to see him. We will not know where he is. Yeah, but he said he won't. But he said that the jungle just following us in the jungle and the jungle was hard. Jungle was so hard. I've created some uh, heat rash on my back and it was not going anywhere. And oh, I had lumps of my back just... Red raw, like, I don't know how I didn't get infected because the 
when you wear day sack and the body armor, it will flush us against your back. And they just swear. And they just, I was wet every day, wet, sleep in the hammock in the middle of the night. We need to set up hammocks and stuff like that before the um, before the last light because uh, you can't navigate through the jungle, especially secondary, primary. What well, this is what they're telling us, and at night time because you will get lost. It's it's not advisable. We're not special forces. So don't start trying to be funny. Just set up camp before last light and set up hammocks. So we have to set them up before night time because and because it's safer for a start and daylight. But daylight goes away about six, seven o'clock in the evening in the middle of the summer. When you're setting up the ham hammocks, is it because you can't be on the floor because of the insects? Yeah. Yeah. What did you see? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, uh, eyes. Eyes. There were a lot of recluse spiders that came out at night time. Oh. A lot. Mate, there's a lot of, mate. Listen, mm. you've got your torch out, mate. All you see this little thinking fucking <laughs> things just staring at you, mate. And I'm telling you, I might be a soldier. I might have done things and people, like, I'm not into this shit. I'm sorry. Like, I don't want that shit. Get the fuck away from me. <laughs> I love Brecon. For the mm. reason I love Brecon, because I know there's nothing in Brecon yeah, apart from sheep, sheep shit, and some grass that I have to crawl through. But in in in, in those places, yeah, you better watch it. But that and, was your favourite. Yeah, it was my favourite <laughs> because it was challenging. Like it, I'm I'm only saying this stuff right now because it was challenging because I've evaluated things in my life, and this has happened like decade, not a decade ago, within the last decade or so, right? So this is just a, uh, and uh, and that's how I found it now. Right now, because when I when I left the army, I'm gonna be honest with you. My 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 life came to to a standstill. It, it literally, I've lost so much responsibility, and I sometimes wish that. Like sometimes I think that like, should have I really left? I was a PTR battalion to see Could have gone to Perbri. Could have done got a couple of promotions. Could have trained the young troops up. And blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to get out because I wanted to have a family, you see. And I don't think that being in the army under my conditions and my mindset, it would have been adequate enough for me to raise a family. I'm hands on. I'm full in. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm straight in. Like, I'm going to get water bottles, mate. And like, get the nappies and that. Like, Shut up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Let's go. And whatever. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a hands on practical man like that in life in general. So I probably will be with uh, my wife and so on. So hence why I need to leave the army because like I come to the stage of life where I need to be much more mature and sensible about my, my decisions and start being being responsible, become a father and so on, which is the aim of an agenda. If it doesn't happen, it's because it doesn't happen. But that's my aim and agenda in life. Get married and have children in, within the wedlock, not outside the wedlock. It's just the way I'm functioning. And that's the way I operate. And um, <clears throat> so I left the army where I feel I was at my highest. I feel I, I've reached one of the highest levels of my existence within the army. They say that, don't they? I think you mentioned that the other night, that guys who are in the army find it hard to, cheat, to find that excitement after being in there because they have reached their highest point. Mm, so when I left, I, I just lost, all, I had no responsibilities. I didn't need to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and lying blokes up in front of me, wait all day kid and take him for eight mile tab, came back, have a breakfast, yeah, and then go to the gym. Like, I'll do this stuff. Like, I, I was conditioned. Like, first of all, when I did the boxing training with, with, with the battalion, this wasn't like one day a week training. We trained four times a day, five times a day, uh, five times a week, four times a day, and then sometimes even Saturday sparring sessions, but Sunday off. But I would go and run on a Sunday to add more weight off, to just remove more weight. Hence why I managed to lose it. But it was also my own discipline. Like That's what I like about the boxing. It was all about me, my discipline, how I be able to meet this target and get in the ring and be at the way to represent the battalion, you know? And the same in the, uh, when I left the army, I, just, I, didn't, I didn't have that anymore. There was no reason for me to do anything. I didn't put away. I weigh nearly 100 kilograms, mate. Do you know what I mean? I've not been for a run for about a year and a half, two years, especially the lockdown killed me off. I met some girl that had a detrimental impact on me, just destabilized me a little bit more. I had a lot of turbulence when I left the army. I had like, uh, I'm on my fifth job since 2018. 
and I got sacked from three of them. And I say got sacked from three of them. Some of them I got dismissed or not past the probation period. So either way, to me, to me, that's a, it's a failure, but it's a learning experience because I anticipated these things. So I got lucky. Well, I say I got lucky. Um, I have economical brain and I know about money and finances. While I was in the army, I wasn't spending my money on anything insignificant and worthless. I just I saved up all my capital and I purchased myself some properties in, in, in the country. And when I left the army, that income helped me also being like float or stay above the water. Like I can breathe, I can breathe. Yeah. And uh, I got, I got, I managed through it. It was, it was a turbulent period. Just uh, uh, um, integrating again or, uh, or just trying to learn how to speak to civilians. They're so fucking weak. They're so fucking sensitive sometimes at work, yeah? And and it's just, just pettiness. I just, I'm not into pettiness. Like, just cheap stuff, pettiness. I work in social housing and I like helping people. And I'm really good at it. So I, I execute quite a lot of things. And I'm uh, where I work now, is I fit in and I do a lot of work for them. And I don't complain. I like doing that. It makes me look good. And also it's the way I operate. And plus they can't sack me if my my product, productive levels are uh, pretty high, you know. So it's okay now. But I put, like, this is why I decided to tell my story also. Because I think it's, I think I have a unique story. I'm not saying that I, I needed to go through 20 years on the throne in Dubai to to say I'm hard as fuck or anything. that It's not about that. It's about just education for people because I'm genuinely not from this country. Like, I might sound and I have a dialect and sometimes I might have a dialect of the land, dialect or so on, but I'm not that trampy to say that I'm English. I can never say that. It's like too embarrassing. Like I'll be so embarrassed if I call myself English. Like not because you're scummy people. No, it's because I'm fucking, I've got history, mate. Uh, I like Alexander the Great knows where my country is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Marco Polo and so on. In the ninth century, we discovered oil. It took us 900 years to know where it does. Oh, we got there finally, right? 1066, was it? That William the Conqueror got to England, right? Yeah. Took you 900 years to win a fucking trophy. Where you got there? But you know what I mean? People get there. It's just, it's just life. Because the only way that humans progress is by exchanging ideas, knowledge, and trade, that there's no other way how we progressed in the past in the human civilizations, ever. There was no other way. It's how we're based off for thousands of years, exchanging ideas, knowledge, and trade. It's not exchanging cultures. It's not muscling on people's cultures. It's not telling them that you're, you're a fucking French now because you decided to be French. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's, it's straight up, it's, it's, it's a fact. Chinese invented printing press. We've got books now because of Chinese. But we, what we're writing them is because of the Sumerians, according to contemporary uh, knowledge. And who, who invented paper? The Egyptians, the papyrus paper. Before that, it was scriptures by the Egyptians. And then they got to the Chinese. And then they had compass before the rest of the world, navigating the, the, the world by using the stars. Chinese had compass. Like, they didn't give it to us straight away, but they did eventually, you know? They did eventually. Somebody had to give someone knowledge of nuclear weapons, or they steal it. You know, that's how we progressed. That's the way the society, human civilizations function. People fail to understand that. And I also look at the, um, the disparities and the uh, dramatic changes and dramatic differences that exist in my part of the world, all the West in Asia, all the way down to the, uh, the, the Zanzibar and all across East Africa and all the Arab and Turkish and Persian world. And then I look at the West and I, and I have to make these things, these differences, and have to highlight things to them. I mean, there, there is no, this is not, we don't have sex education like this in our schools. I'm sorry, but it's a little bit too, too over. Like, there's no Sam Sniffs on our telly. There is no way we're going to see Sam Sniff asshole on our telly. There is no way. Absolutely ain't happening. That, that's just, that's, that's a fact. I'm just saying, you know. Looking back on your life then, Aidan, would you say that it was the most stressful and challenging times that gave you the most mental and spiritual growth. What is? And looking back on your life. The army. The, the army. army. Yeah. Like, I'm telling you, so I have no idea what I would have been, but, but it, 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 I put myself through the paces. 
right? I put myself in the environment amongst proper men of war, proper men who can proper fucking bang, proper do weights, proper shoot, like proper men of morals and ethics. I had to be in that environment and I did okay, you know? I put myself there. They didn't ask me to join the army. Fucking hell, bruv. Nobody in this country gave me absolutely anything. And I don't expect nothing from you. Because I didn't come here. Like, my mom and dad brought me here. They didn't raise me with handouts or hate. So, I was not raised in handouts. I do not need nothing from the English. Like, I've got... Like, you have the society. And it has the resources. And I'm utilising those resources. And and, 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 and it utilises the full scope of my capabilities. Because you have this happening. You know, there's certain places on the planet Earth that does not have this freedom. Especially, especially in any country that's saying that English are scummy. Like if someone calls you, like if someone tries to muscle in on your culture or call you any names and trying to diminish your existence or trying to humiliate you because of your history, their countries are the worst. Yeah, you remember that Indian people don't do that. They like you actually. What's your biggest life lesson? What's my biggest life lesson? I don't know. I... I've learned from people's mistakes. Don't take a random girl to a hotel room you don't even know and she's drunk. Next thing you know, you're doing three, four years for rape because she said so. Because when you wake up with her, right, she might look not look too right or you might not look good enough for her. Maybe she didn't like it. Maybe you said something because trust me, girls will remember this shit. You can hurt their soul. You can hurt a woman's soul through words, let alone beating her up and shit. So, guy could we must have said something horrible to her that morning, and she found it very, very uh, degrading, and she just went to the police, like because she wanted to hurt you, not because you did what you did is the truth. Like that happens to guys, and I don't want to be that guy. Like I've never had sex with a woman that is drunk. I've never picked up a girl in the bar. There's no girls in my hotel rooms ever. I don't find that, and I watch other men do this consistently. They get caught up in this. Like, I just, I'm never going to be that man. I can, I have reasonable di di discipline with women. And I'm, I'm more of a penguin anyway. And you don't drink? No, I don't drink. So I'm more of a penguin. So I like staying, sticking to one woman. And would for, you say it was your upbringing that keeps you in, on, not on check? It's a fundamental foundation of my, my, my development. Because it's like, like Robert Sapolsky also mentioned this in his book. It says that, you, 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 you can, like, like, like the, the environment could be horrible. Like the world out there, you need to tell your children, some people are scummy, right? Yeah. And they need to know that. So they'll be able to navigate through the world. Otherwise, they'll be very scared. But if you apply hate and beat your children up, abuse your children, they will contribute to that environment. Remember that, right? It, it starts from you. Your children will be contributing element to the to the to the disparities of the society based on what you do to them, and that's a fact. That applies to everyone. That does that. It's it's not cultural and it's it's not religious and it, it, it ain't not also ethnic, ethnic, ethnical. Like your skin color is never the, the common denominator behind your failings. It is your parents. Yeah, what foundation they set up for you. And I'm not saying I'm a billionaire. Like I have a mortgage, couple mortgages. Right? Yeah. My sister has a two thousand pound, two thousand percent higher mortgage than me. And she has a family to feed and so on. So like I'm not extraordinary wealthy. I don't have a private jet, you know, but I can know how to rise up an economic ladder. I had nothing, but I did not come from nothing. That's the problem. I'll never say that. That's a that's just that's, that's pathetic, that's trampy. It's like somebody just like I did not come from nothing. Like I literally come from something. From someone who didn't speak English then who's so well-spoken now and so knowledgeable, how did you grasp the English language like this? Uh, I, I hanged around with the English. So at the very early stages, when I, when I first joined the army, my vocabulary was, was uh, poor. Uh, it was basic. I could navigate and I could speak and I could speak English, but to say that I could use, um, uh, trying to uh, promote a theory or explain a theory or like so any political ideology or anything like that, I would not have the words to be able to articulate myself because my brain just didn't have the vocabulary. Uh, uh, um, it, it, it did not have the vocabulary uh, memorized. So and I had to read books and I had to... At first stages in school, I used to just copy text because I, I, I'm well aware that... Um, 
like if you keep reading your one's going to get better and you'll remember more things and your vocabulary expands so I, I and because i could speak different languages i could uh i just used to copy the text and then the words then become apparent when somebody says that word i'm like oh that's what that means and then when they put sentence together, I'll listen how they put sentence together. And then when I joined the army, I start to speak to the officers and so on. And then my vocabulary expanded from that because uh, they speak really good English, most of them anyway. And I, I just think that's like, I just like to speak better English. It's just, for me, it's a skill. Like I have acquired another skill in life by learning another language. I already could speak too by the time I got here. So it's not like I was learning something that was, I was, well, I love this shit because I'm now can speak English. No, it could have been German actually, or it could have been Spanish. Can you German. speak Scouse? No, no, <laughs> mate. No. Only the Scouse speak Scouse. I don't, I don't, do they speak English? <laughs> <laughs> you had, you had they, some good uh, relationships though with some Scouses, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I did. I've got, I've got a good relationship with all the northerners in general um, i had my own um setbacks or my own little frictions with them but on the general i've never felt even threatened by the by the any northerners that they, they, they're just friendly people in general i just found northerners a lot more friendlier in the united kingdom than the southerners because coming here you said you always knew you, where you were with the scousers yeah no you do you do know where you are of course it's like the it's, it's like the traveler community isn't it you're never gonna walk into traveler side and expect them a, a, a pleasant welcome right yeah but they're certainly not gonna smash the fuck out to you and beat you to death just because you exist <laughs> you're probably gonna get beat up by one of them and everyone's standing watch and then you have to shake your hands and walk off you know what i mean and i can take that all day fucking long I'm like, all day long i don't want to be up every day yeah but um i'd rather live in a society that has those social belief systems i think it's much safer for the children also you know in general but that's just my outlook <laughs> And now that you're living such a mundane life, quiet life, <laughs> it <laughs> well, is. so I think. It is, it's so, yeah. What do you brain. do for excitement? Oh, I go to university to put my professors on the spot because no one else seems to be engaging for nine grand a year. Well, a professor, I don't know why. I try to attend debates and I just like, I want to be a social commentator. <laughs> and I think I have the means to be able to be uh, commentating on people's existence in this country because no one has me like there's nobody like me out there i'm aware of that and i'm very arrogant about it so <laughs> it's um it's just gonna it's gonna work out well for me once i get uh i get promoted a bit in this media field but we'll see what happens sometimes it takes an outsider to become the observer but I genuinely I felt like that in America. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Of course though. Yeah, no, you would. You yeah. are already different. You're automatically programmed. You can't you have to think a certain way and you're like, fuck, you know, that's a bit what the <laughs> fuck is going on there? You know? And yeah. it, it just happens. It's natural. Human people just we just do weird stuff sometimes. So have you met the woman and settled down and had the kid? Not yet. No, I might have to go home and get my passport out on that. <laughs> oh yeah, which village am I going first? Line them up, turning up. <laughs> <laughs> so people can follow you on instagram we're going to include your instagram yeah that's fine right. yeah that's great and um do you want to just tell the viewers who've been with you for the last two hours any final thoughts for, for the viewers on that camera there life doesn't ask you what you want the present you with options that's Bye. it thank you for listening viewers yeah thanks for listening viewers please let us know in the comments what you think about this podcast Go and follow Aiden on Instagram, but make sure if you call him an uh, Azerbaijani or Azeri, <laughs> you pronounce it or spell it right. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Athletic Greens. All links in the description box and Jen's links are down there as well. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Give us a hug, big man. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, give us a hug, man. Ah, oh, you like that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well done. Oh, well, brilliant. Yeah, it's nice yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. So Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats. And Peter was hired out of Scotland, mercenary by the Cali Cartel, to assassinate Pablo Escobar 
one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world. The mission is all detailed in the book, as well as Peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world. So mind-blowing, gripping, as seen on BBC TV. This is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. The link will be in the description box below the video, available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers.